What's up everybody, I'm Finn McKenty. this is the Punk Rock NBA, and I just got back from a quick little trip, a quick but action-packed trip to Southern California, went down to Orange County in LA, shot a whole bunch of interviews over the course of a couple days, which I will be posting here over the next few weeks. And today I'm bringing you the first one with my friend Biggie of Good Fight Entertainment. So he is on the management side of things. We talked about a whole bunch of stuff that comes up in the comments all the time, stuff that you guys have asked about a lot, like what exactly a manager does and doesn't do for a band, when it might make sense for your band to look for management, what's enabled some of the bands in his roster like Every Time I Die, Between the Buried Me and Circus Survive to have such long careers, and why on the like younger side of the spectrum, Knock Loose and Turnstile have blown up so fast, and also cleared up a lot of the common misperceptions about labels and contracts and what happens when bands get in a fight with their manager and all that kind of stuff. So check this one out and stay tuned for the rest of them to come over the next couple weeks. I talked to Big Hurt of Fresh Out, Randall Pitch, the CEO of Live Fit, to Dee Murthy, the CEO of 5-4 Group, co-founder of Young and Reckless. Really excited to sit down with these people who are doing shit that I find interesting and inspiring, and hopefully you will agree. So yeah, check this one out with Biggie and stay tuned for the rest of them. I got into this by meeting the Orange County hardcore bands, the Throwdowns, Eights and Visions, Bleeding Throughs, becoming friends with them, ending up going on tour with them. In that early 2000s era of touring, I met all those bands, which included Every Time I Die, toured with Every Time I Die, decided I wanted to get off the road after about 10 years and wanted to be a manager, and they let me manage them as my first client. So that's the, the short of the very yeah. long of it. So I did about 10 years on the road, and now I'm about 11 years into managing Band so you were like, I didn't realize you were on the road that much. It was like a tour manager? Yeah, tour manager. Got I, it. Well, I started selling merch, and then it was like the, uh, we also need someone to like hold our money while we, you know, or, or yeah, whatever, yeah. To, to yeah. handle the basic logistics. So I, I would start tour managing from going from merch guy, and then being the guy that would hold the money, and then being the guy that would go settle at night, then being the guy that would call the label, then being the guy that would deal with the van when it broke down, then right. you know, before I knew it, I was tour managing. And that was kind of the beginning of when bands like in our world even started having yeah, tour managers. Because totally. before that, like a tour manager, what the fuck are you talking oh, about? Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, I didn't really have so you like- you split zero dollars, you know, six ways? <laughs> exactly. Uh, when, I remember when, when it was like a thing because I was out with 18 Visions they, and they put out, uh, it had to be Vanity, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, and there was money coming in and we were just like, we're traveling with money. Right. Like, this is weird. I remember right. calling the label, you know, Josh Chesco be like, we have money and like, right. I don't know what to do with this, you know? So it was a- We've never done this before. Yeah, we learned, everyone learned together on the go. Some of my clients are Circus Survive, Every Time I Die, Between the Buried and Me, Knock Loose, Turnstile, kind of a lot of bands that I have my hands in. Can you just explain exactly what a manager does and doesn't do? Like, do you book shows for bands? Do you- help them sure. find a label what do you do and not do well it's funny because that's a very common question and if you like ask my wife for example who <laughs> knows me very well she'd be like i don't know like sometimes he's talking about this sometimes yeah. but they don't no one really knows that's not in it but uh my friend explained it almost better what we don't do it's easier to explain so everyone's first question is so like band goes on tour you like book the show it's like no that's the booking agent oh okay well like if they get like a contract, do you like go over that? It's like, yeah, but technically their lawyer really goes over that. It's like, oh, okay, so you're the guy like that's on the tour with them and like making sure, no, that's that's actually the tour manager. You don't you know, do shit. I don't do anything, which is the <laughs> biggest secret in the world. Just kind of get into management and you don't do anything. Um, but it's truly everything else. It's a liaison in between every decision there is. Every, from, from tiny decisions like shirt designs to big decisions on what deal we should take to sign to a label uh, and, and everything in between. And, a lot of it, as we get older, is straight up therapist, psychologist, you know, just having time to deal with someone who's having a hard day on the road or having a tough time now in their marriage or mm -hmm. missing their kids, like that kind of thing. That's a huge part of it. But like, someone's it, like, I don't know if I want a tour anymore. Totally. But yeah, I get those calls all the time yeah. from bands that people would go like, <gasps> you know, like th that happens. But for like nuts and bolts and probably your viewership to understand and like really get it. It's like we just, we deal with all elements of business for the band and while there are other people that help, business managers, booking agents, lawyers, all those people that are all part of the team, if you look at it as all those people are up here, I'm in the middle liaisoning info and or getting info from the band back and forth to those people, making sure the ship runs and making sure the booking agent stays on track and making sure the 
merch is ready to get on tour, making sure we have a crew book, making sure visas are ready, making sure flights are booked. I mean, it seems kind of endless, but at the same time, like it, it's, it's just seems like whatever slack there is, mm -hmm. we pick up and for better, for worse. So like when I started managing, there was no social media. And now that's a huge part of our life. Like we mm -hmm. have a social media department at Good Fight because there is such a demand for it in so many platforms. Like there's no chance I could keep up with understanding those platforms, let alone mastering them, let alone then implementing them. Mm -hmm. I need someone else to do that. And it's at that point where sadly like... So your job as a manager is to put together the team that will do a great job of running that. Exactly. Not necessarily doing it yourself. Right. And, and every management company is different. Like some people handle others, things that other people don't. I handle things for certain bands that I don't for other bands because it was like an old thing that I regret doing. Like <laughs> I never want to be the business manager for any bands ever again, but I am the business manager for a couple bands uh -huh. because it's just... I'm not gonna all of a sudden say, hey, you gotta like pay this other dude 5% now, right. just because right. that's just not cool, you know? Um, well, before I get into the other questions, that is one thing I wanted to clear up, because I think it explains a lot of things in the management world and things that do and don't make sense. How do managers get paid? Do they pay you a salary? Do you get a percentage? Like, how does that work exactly? Everyone's different, of course. Gotta start off by saying that. But generally, the industry standard is the manager will make 15% of every dollar. So if a band goes out and gets paid a thousand bucks, Manager gets paid 150 bucks. The band goes out and sells a thousand dollars of merch. This is where it gets gray, but a manager makes 15% of that. Most companies this day and age will do a net deal, so it's at least 15% after the merch bill is paid. So on a thousand dollars, maybe 650 of that is true net. You commission 15% of that leftover 650. But it's also across the board. So any deal, you know, whether it's album deals, royalties, it's Every dollar, and like I said, it's 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 a sliding scale, and a, a, a so if they play their song in a Mazda commercial, that's part. They of make twenty grand, and we get fifteen percent of it. You know, yeah. so it's it's supposed to be on every dollar. It doesn't always work out like that because when the band goes to Europe and expenses are high, I'm not going to be like, hey, you owe me fifteen percent of the one thousand dollars. <laughs> you know, you, you come up with a thousand dollars left. Well, technically, you owe me six thousand yeah. dollars, right? Based off of all the numbers. Let's not be that, you right. know? So we're, that's the other good thing about having a lot of bands is I'm not solely relying on one income. You know, there's a lot of revenue streams for us to where when a band needs uh, a break, we can cut them the break, you know? And, and deals are different across the board. You know, you'll hit, by no means when Metallica goes and plays and makes millions of dollars, that is their manager making 15%. Once right. it gets to a certain level, they're usually on a salary base or a much slimmed down commission. but. We do a 15% at Good Fight, we do a 15% net deal. Well, the reason I ask is because a common question that I hear from people, whether it's bands or producers or you know various other kinds of people is like, they ask, well, how do I get a manager? Thinking that the situation is they don't, their problem is I don't have enough business, whether that's I don't have enough shows or enough clients or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. How do I get a manager who will like bring me all this work? And my answer to them usually is, remember, a manager gets paid a percentage. So it just doesn't make financial sense for a good manager to work with you until you're kind of at the point where you almost don't need a manager. There's like that middle ground totally. where uh, that's where it makes sense. But I think it's important for people to think about it that way when they're looking for a manager is what's in it for you. Yeah. Because you get a percentage and if it's 15% of a thousand bucks a year, it just doesn't make financial sense for you to take that on. No, especially when I'm paying salaries, so I'd actually lose money on a band like that. Because that's, like I said, every company's different, but the way we're set up, if I put more responsibilities on anyone's plate at the company, I give them a raise mm -hmm. in some form or another, you know? And um, that doesn't mean you don't like the band if you say you can't well, work with Of course with not. It's, it's just, just dollars and cents. Yeah. You know? um, exactly that. That's, what, that's the hardest question. I get the random email so much about like, how do, you know, you've talked about it at nauseum, you know, like the next step, how do you get yeah, the next level, right. blah, blah, blah. It's just like, you'll know and the manager will know yeah. and it's so rare that there's just this amazing band making money that nobody has their eye on. You know? Right. <laughs> like right, it's right. just so rare. Like right. some booking agent has seen it or heard of it and they bring it to a manager friend and there's like, just dude, some- Do you know how many tickets these guys have been selling? Exactly. Yeah. Like when I get a new band, it's never like, oh, I just grabbed them. It's like, okay, we're one of six people they're meeting with. Hopefully we win the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, you know, the contest. So how, how would you approach something like that then? If there's like, you know, a band that's making some buzz and there's five, six people who want to work with them, like what would you do to get them to choose to work with you as opposed to the other people in the deal? 
Uh, I come at them, I think I relate to band members really well because I spent 10 years on the road, you know, so I can get down into the nitty gritty of touring better than most, you know, um, and understand that in 2019, that's where the vast majority of money's coming from. No matter, everyone wants to talk about like syncs and publishing and all that fun stuff, which is cool for like this tiny, tiny echelon of bands. Like most bands uh, make the vast majority of their money from touring and I can level with them on that and I can just explain to them that I, I get bands, I love bands, and I, I'm, our style is not for everybody in terms of um, focusing on touring and focusing on merch and focusing on things that actually make you money. So if that's not your avenue, cool. As opposed to what? What would be the other things that some other people might focus on instead of that? Song syncs and getting their songs in Mazda's commercials. Mm -hmm. that, that's not my specialty. It's happened. Mm -hmm. We've got some cool syncs, but it's like it's from the publishing company. You know, but there are, I'm sure there's some movers and shakers out there that can be like, you sign with me and we're doing this. Mm -hmm. And that's just not my style. I break it down for them very brass tacks being like, what are your goals? That sounds like my world. If not, over here. Here's, you know? here's how... I would see us working together. Totally. If you're into that, let's do it. Exactly. If you're not, all good. Exactly. And I don't, that a, a big, a big thing difference with us and a lot of management companies is we don't do contracts. So my pitch is always hire us. If you don't like us, you can walk away at any time. There's no contract in terms of you sign with us, you're with us for three years. There's no sunset clause, meaning like if I booked you a tour in a year and a half and you fire me, you still owe me money on that tour. It's like, I mean, very rarely happens. It's like if you don't want to work with this anymore, you go, I go. I think that's kind of appealing, you know? That's See, that's interesting to me because, you know, there's lots of times when I've been working with people who obsess over redlining a contract five rounds back and forth on it. And I, I, I get that. Obviously, you know, there is a legal argument to be made for that. But to me, it's like, are any of us ever going to litigate over this? Because right. it's like six grand. No. So either we trust each other or we don't. Right. Yeah, and especially in the service-based industry where like, I get it, if you're a label and like we're putting in hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially into this and like, yeah. gotta have some contracts there. For us, it's like, it's time, it's really, it's time, you know? And I get it, it would be and terrible. Would if, you want to like lock somebody into a yeah, you know what I mean? I have some crazy stories where like, I've been managing a band like they left the manager, I'm now managing them, and they had to be like, dude, they like showed us this contract we signed a long time ago, and we are screwed if we don't stay with them, and like yeah. lost the lost the band to go back to them. It's either like you can manage us and pay them for two years, yeah. and then we're free. I'm just like, that sounds insane. So as a manager, like, why, why would you, you want to be like that? Why, why would you want to work with somebody who doesn't want to be with you? I yeah. don't understand that. I don't understand it either. Or maybe, like I said, it's maybe it's like they have to. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's an ego thing, or it's just like cutthroat from an era that they're right, from, right. but. Maybe coming from punk hardcore touring, I'd just be like, that sounds terrible. Like, like you how wanna... could you even have that phone call? Like, <laughs> like after they realize that they're locked in, you're like, okay, well, let's uh, let's talk on Monday about you know what's going on with this tour. Like, yeah, it's, I, it just needs to be the weirdest call ever. <laughs> it's crazy, and, and you know, I have some friends that I respect as managers that do contracts, and they have some horror stories where it's like, dude, I worked three years on this band when nobody cared. And it started getting traction. We started getting the things lined up. You know, let's say back then it would be like a warp tour or whatever, like some big, like potentially career changing scenario. And then, you know, Johnny Sexy manager comes around and I want to be with them because their bands mm -hmm. are bigger. It's like, I just got screwed on three years of my life. So yeah. it's like, I don't want to say, I don't want to like, you know, shit on someone who yeah. does contracts, but I don't think that's the case most of the time. Yeah. We're talking about, you know, the minority. So in the majority of the time in my life, I work with more established bands. Uh, with long careers and it seems to work out for me knowing that the door is open on either side at all times. That's just yeah, how I'm, I want I'm not talking shit on contracts and there's a time and a place for them. Yeah. I, my thing is just like arguing over, you know, whether the comma should be between the therefore and and. It's just <laughs> like, dude, who, like, we're not, like, if, if we're talking about like the rights to the next season of Stranger Things, sure, let's make sure every T and yeah. I or you know but for most things it's just like either I trust you or I don't and if I don't trust you no contract in the world is gonna stop you from trying to fuck me or vice versa totally you know what I mean totally. like if somebody's a snake they don't give a shit what it says in the contract yep yeah exactly and it, there's just never been a time where I'm like <sighs> like people think it's some magic talisman that like you hold it, it says this in the contract, like yeah. it's a, a 
garlic to a vampire and then like it's gonna suddenly make you like unable to be dishonest that's yeah. just not how it is yeah. people think there's a lot of magic people think like <laughs> That band, man, that dude manages this band. If I sign with him, we'll be the next this yeah. band. And it's like, let me tell you something. If that dude could make the next this band, he would have already done it. Exactly. So there's some magic with that band, and that's the like I deal with that all the time because like, I don't manage the hugest bands, yeah. but I mean they're all great career bands that like I'm so lucky to have the roster I have. But I don't have anyone that's sold out, you know, Staples Center or even arenas, mm -hmm. you know, like. So when I hear that being like people I'm going up against for like a new client it's like oh they have like this band and da 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 like kind of roster comparing I'm like that's great like maybe maybe you would be the next huge band mm -hmm. but chances are there was lightning in a bottle there and that's yeah. why the rest of his roster isn't like that you know well same way as people like to say that the reason why their band didn't blow up is because the label didn't support them or this or that or the other as though the label has, or anybody has, like this magic button. Yeah. To make, I the label's not going to, like, you know what I don't want? Exactly. Another huge exactly. band. Exactly. I don't want another huge like, band. Like, if the labels had some machine where they just put bands in and, like, you know, platinum albums, they would do it every time. All but, of us would do it all the time ever. But you even know? the biggest label or management company has lots and lots of flops. Duds. Yeah. Because that's just the way it goes. Yeah. And that's the, that's the sad thing about it is the flops take up the exact same amount of time, probably more, than the huge money makers. But that's just the game you play. The 80-20 principle yeah. is so true in management, it's like gross. When I heard that, I was just like, it was like somebody <laughs> just shined a mirror in my face, and I'm like, you're right. My life. <laughs> you are right. Mo most of the money I make are from these easy bands that just get it and go, and people like them, and it goes, and then all the time I'm spending are these bands where it's like, I'm trying to fit square pegs and round holes across the board. You know, trying to find their fan base, trying to find the tour to take them on, trying to find the label to sign them, versus like, yep, yeah, of course you want to play with Turnstile. Right. <laughs> of right. course you want to take right. take out every time I die. Like, yeah. These are cool bands and valuable bands, versus some other bands where I'm just like, please, <laughs> give me that, you know? Well, speaking of those bands, like the career bands, uh, it's a, a, a kind of segment of bands I've been thinking about a lot lately. It's like, every time I die, between the very me, um, circa, you know, who are not, they're definitely good sized bands, mm -hmm. but they're not huge. Uh, however, they will be able to, I think any of those bands could play shows for 30 more years if they want uh, yeah. to. They have found their fan, their fans are along for the ride. Yeah. 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 What are you, and, and, and that to me is like what, if I was in a band, that's the template I would pursue. Yeah. You've mentioned that you'd rather yeah. have like a smaller diehard exactly. fan base than like a come and go. Like, yeah. Yeah. I've watched it with some of my friends' bands that are bigger. And I'll be like, oh man, what's up with the band? It's like, ah, last single didn't take off, so we're kind of just stuck home for a year. I'm just like, what? You know, <laughs> right. like depending on that is insane. Yeah. Um, so what are the what are the you've worked with so many of these bands, or even the ones you haven't worked with, you've been friends with them mm -hmm. for decades, I'm sure. Um, what are the kind of common threads you see with bands that have that kind of longevity? Um, let's see. I think it's doing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be able to cut that. I've seen your editing. That's right. <laughs> uh, commonalities between them. I feel like all the bands that I, I try to focus on a nice mixture. Like I said, I focus a lot on touring. A nice mixture of types of touring they do. So it's cool to be the cool, credible band, but it's also cool to get new fans. Mm -hmm. You know, like every time I die is probably like the standout on all of them and like the biggest I've ever been and cool enough to go and play, you know with whoever the converges of the world, but also like... They're, they're the coolest now that they've ever been, I Right, think. you know, but they'll, and they'll go and play with some like not cool band and be the cool band on that bill. And we've been doing that forever. We did every other Warp Tour for like over a decade. Mm -hmm. We did even Warp Tours since from when I was touring with them up until the last one. So Warp Tour is to get Plug new, new fans. fans. Hey, we're this, and, and the same thing. They were never the band where like, Dude, we're up against every time I die slot. They, they were, they did great, but they weren't yeah. the like pierce the veil of that right, year right. or anything like that ever. But what they always did was have young bands talk about them on stage, mm -hmm. and tons of new kids checking them out. Like I've heard, I've seen that name for a long time. Like, oh wow, you watch them, you're walking away a fan. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, they're cool, they play tight. You're at work tour, so you like aggressive music. Like, yep. gonna, they're gonna win you over. So what I'm hearing there with them is that they didn't sort of reject no. the. Um, the younger generation, exactly. the way a lot of bands do. Exactly, and the opposite. We're very much focused on understanding that, like, look, we're asking people to come out and see us up to four times a year sometimes, you yeah. know? Like, 
you gotta get new people out. Think about what it takes now to get somebody off the couch, away from Netflix, buy a ticket, drive to the show, get it. Oh my God, like there is just a billion roadblocks that it's a lot occur. Of there. Yeah. yeah, there's a billion roadblocks that occur. So we need the biggest pool possible. And the only way to have a big pool is to focus on young people. And in our case of heavier music, like girls, mm -hmm. you know, there's a very overlooked uh, demographic, sadly, where it's like, you forget that if girls like your band, you have 100% more people yeah, right. like potentially at your shows. And so you see the bands that do really well, it's like a nice mix of mm -hmm. male and females, mm -hmm. you know, old and young. I think like A Day to Remember is a perfect example of that. Yeah. They've never pandered to like, you know, the fangirl kind of audience, but girls have always been welcome at their shows, totally. as well as guys. And like, to me, that's like the template for how, again, how I would approach it if I was in a band. Right. And you know, maybe Day to Remember loses like, the dude in the torch shirt or whatever. Oh no. But they gain all the people that go to Warp Tour and right. go that like spend money on music and potentially are lifelong fans. Right. You know? Like I'll take that all day. And it's I'm not saying you shouldn't be like strategic about it and like, you know, cater to that demographic, but maybe don't try to like consciously push them right. away. Right. <laughs> Make the show like an unsafe environment, yeah. the hardest thing right. possible. And like, you know, that's your band, that's your band. It is what right. it is. But if you have some way to try to include everyone in every way, it's just better for business for across sure. the board, you know? So the the flip side of that, you work with some of those like career bands, you also work with some, I guess, newer bands like say Knock Loose and Turnstile, who kind of both came out of the gate pretty strong and have got a level of, I'll, I guess I'll say mainstream exposure. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not being played on the radio, but they talk about them on Billboard and NPR yeah. and shit. Um, what would you say are the keys to those two bands in particular getting the attention of those kind of mainstream outlets and that kind of audience? Right. Um, obviously, just like we were talking about, if I could push the button, it'd be like, oh, this is what Turnstile did, this is what Knock Loose did. Yeah. There's no direct answer, but I can tell you that Turnstile is the most inclusive band there is. And they're a funny one because sometimes the way they make decisions and think and sometimes overthink things drive me nuts and we'll be thinking like this is such a no-brainer why are we not doing this uh -huh. but then we as 40 year old dudes that sit behind desk all day have to understand that like there is a method to their madness mm -hmm. whatever they're doing playing the music they're playing that the average person could the average even underground music listener could be like i don't know see what's so cool about this right there's got to be a method of their madness. Yeah. So I credit them a lot of it. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a lot of contacts. They are juiced in to the underground and the above ground and everywhere else that like in a way that I'm not. So I can guide them as best I can in terms of like managing a career and like being smart with decisions and like mm -hmm. budgeting and all that jazz. But like, there's got to be some level of like, hey, you know more than me in this. So in that band in particular, that's what I think the case is. They they're on you know. Not a major label, mm -hmm. so some of those press looks, those aren't me. That's not me calling up, be like, sure, we need right. the cover of GQ. Right. <laughs> not me. They have a gnarly publicist. They yeah. got us insane opportunities. And but but even then, that same publicist could try to get me in GQ, and it's not going to happen. No, exactly. So there's something about them exactly that's special, and, and they're infectious. And it's the same thing. If you see them live, no matter if you think like they sound like two eleven, <laughs> fuck this, you leave going like that was fucking cool. Yeah, it's undeniable. You yeah. cannot not. My daughter's six, and they're her favorite band because she watched them. Just like these guys are so cool yeah. and so nice, and like legitimately care about creating a safe and fun environment for everybody. It's you can't fake that. Mm -hmm. You can't, and it's just you feel that, you know. So how about Knock Loose? Because that's the one that actually surprises me more. Yeah, like Turnstile makes sense to me because you know uh, their music is a lot more accessible. Uh, they have like such a cool like aesthetic. Knock Loose is the one, I, I love Knock Loose, but it- Yeah, because it sounds like what you listen to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that, that's like nasty shit. They're not like these huge like personalities that, um, you know, have some larger than life kind of persona, mm -hmm. but they are getting more traction than I would have ever guessed a band like that could get. And I'm really interested in why. Yeah, I, I wish I could tell you exactly why, because it's the same thing where I'll have people that are kind of like fringe being like, I hear about this knock loose band all the time. And those fringe people, I can show them like um, Turnstile or even ETID select songs. Yeah. And they'll be like, oh, okay, if I put on knock loose, they're just like, what? Like, this is just straight out. Yeah. brutal. Like, yeah. I don't get it. The voice is crazy. Where's the singing part? You know? Um, but they're along those same lines where they do their thing. And like, that's 
it, it's strange because where they take influence from is what we grew up on. Yeah. And it's an era where it wasn't a big thing. Right. You know, like the, the 90s or whatever, hardcore wasn't like some, a, some something that like, or even a sound that many people aspired for. Right. And I don't know if it's because this new generation hasn't heard it or they get, um, you know, the cosign from tons of bands mm-hmm. of our generation that all like them musically and personally or um, it's lightning in a bottle or yeah. the label did, you know, Pure Noise is great and they're, they're all over this band. Mm-hmm. I don't know the exact reason. Like, yeah. you know, I wish I had some sexy answer, yeah. but they're, they're just awesome kids making very like calculated decisions and everything has a point. There's no like randomness with art or anything. It's like, it is all very thought out from lyrics to color schemes to who they're touring with. They're already on that like, when we headline, we're gonna show you what we like and we're taking out cool hardcore bands and this is what we listen to, but we're also not afraid to go support very much not hardcore mm-hmm. bands and grab those kids also. Mm-hmm. And I've seen it. I've seen these kids that are like ready for softer music and they stand out like a sore thumb as this heavy band on the bill and it just always totally works. For the kid that, that who's in that crowd that is interested in something heavy, he just found his new favorite band. Oh yeah, and it, that's the same thing. They look, they look great on stage yeah. and play tight. Brian says great like just cool inclusive hardcore yeah. words that like if you've never heard that you're just like what you know he's I mean? a really good front man even though he doesn't have that like huge larger than life persona he's definitely very charismatic in a way yeah. that like you want to look at him when he's on stage or in a video or something you just have a hard time looking away yeah i mean they defy all the questions that everyone wants of like how do i get bigger i need to do this in my world do i need to be in a different city it's like they're from oldham county kentucky yeah. like they created their own thing and toured around their own thing enough to where people just start noticing. And mm-hmm. once you're undeniably good and undeniably making waves, booking agent takes notice, they will take notice. They mm-hmm. say we need a manager, it's just, you know, that's how I feel like a lot of people that watch this go like, what do I do? And it's like, they just start small and the bubble grows and the bubble well, grows. I will say one thing they did, which I think, I, I'm sure it was a, a, a deliberate decision, maybe you can comment on it, was working with Will Putney I think oh, yeah. really leveled them up totally because that first record I think the songs were there but the production was it's okay mm-hmm. but the uh, the one they did with Will was like clearly leveled them up totally yeah uh, I I probably don't give engineers enough credit coming from my world of like that's just the artist brain and the manager brain yeah, are very right, different right like, I'm a linear as fuck person you put me in a spreadsheet right. and I'm like let's go you tell me to like pick out a snare tone I'm just like Dude, please somebody, <laughs> you know, and that's just, they all I sound know. good to me. Tell right. me like. Exactly. And that's knowing your strengths. I think it's a big thing. Like I know my strengths is like on that linear side. And so I'll hire people or get help from people that aren't like that. So I don't mean to forget Will, but Will's incredible. I think Will's delivered some of the best records for my bands that have had, that have a lot of records mm-hmm. ever. And it's very rare that at least my bands, I should say very rare. Mostly my bands like to jump around. And there's a couple that stick with their guy and a couple of very jump around bands are like returning to will mm-hmm. and i'm just like well he's will. definitely the guy right now oh yeah yeah he's definitely the guy and he's broken i mean he did a hard nut to crack uh personality wise people think that like i watched a dvd and those dudes just like do keg stands and party all day like that is not true they're old and have yeah. like a lot of personalities and now a lot of variances with other bands other careers families there's a lot going on there so if you can break into that camp I think you can break into any camp, and they love them. If you look at a lot of those, sorry, I mean to cut you off, but I think there's an interesting point. Is like a lot of these kind of career bands don't really fit neatly into any one place. Right. They kind of just weave between a bunch of them. Totally. And I think there's something to be said for that. Right. Yeah. It's hard. It's just everyone wants to be the cool band, of course. Everyone wants to be like credited from press outlets and all that jazz. But like, if not cool mall kids like your band. Be happy someone does. Yeah. At one point, no one did, and you would have done anything to have a thousand people care about your band, let alone in one city. And then if you, you know, you, you tell the kids starting out, you're gonna play to a thousand people, but it's just kids from the mall that like <laughs> really don't care about music. They'd be like, I don't care. That sounds amazing. <laughs> right. And then you get some notoriety, and you see your friend that was yeah. got praised and pitchforked. You're just like, I gotta be this cool band. And I just wanna be like, dude, just be happy someone cares. I right, promise. Right. Judge success by how long you can do what you love, right. and not who what tastemakers are liking your band yeah. or saying you're cool. You know, if you're making a career out of what you love, you're winning because everyone in the world does jobs they hate. And if you cannot do that, I promise you're winning. 
focus on that side of the positive of it and you know embrace this side that may not be the sexiest mm -hmm. aspect of it and from what i've seen I don't really think that the approval of those tastemaker type people necessarily translates into any kind of business. No. Like, uh, do you know the radio station KEXP by any chance? I don't. They're like one of the bigger indie stations. It's in Seattle. And they have a band play there every day. And they put it on YouTube. And I assumed that these bands were all big because KEXP is so credible and everyone right. says they're so great. And I looked and some of them have like, you know, 1,200 views on this video and their channel has a million subscribers. Yeah. And I'm like, well, nobody gives a shit what this DJ at KEXP thinks. No, nope. and that's what's funny too is even my bands, you know, I don't want to mention anyone else, so I'm like mentioning my bands, like the ones that get touted as like these cool bands have less ticket sales than yeah. maybe like the more embarrassing bands. Or like my best streaming bands are like the bands that from the Warped Tour world, mm -hmm. you know, like by far, including bands that are signed to majors that have been around longer. Like that's just. All demographics are different, so trying to like pick anything, you know, do your best to plan and 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 be strategic, but trying to say like we're writing a record and we're gonna tackle this yeah, demographic. Right, right. It's just like, dude, that is a disaster story that I've read the ending to so many times, <laughs> and I'm just, like some of my own friends' bands where I'm just like, this band's gonna be fucking huge and they're gonna have fans forever. They have this cult following and they write like a pop record. And right. Everyone's like. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 just kidding, just kidding. We're, right, like, we're right, back, we're right, back, right, and it's right. too late, you know? It's too late, yeah. because they know, yeah, they, they, it doesn't feel authentic yeah. anymore. Well, last question I have, um, which I touched on in a video, I'll tell you my point of view on it, see what you think. As far as, you know, a lot of people ask me about working in the music industry, like how do I do that? A lot of people think, they ask, should I go to college for music business? And my answer is, absolutely not. No. You just need to get out there and make friends and be in the right place at the right time and have some sort of skill. Yeah, I mean, the boring word is networking and it's just tried and true 100%. I could be, I'm not the best manager in the world. I'm probably not the best manager in my city, you know? <laughs> I, but I have a big network of people that know me, like me, trust me, and then I have the wherewithal to know that if I want to serve these bands properly, I need all these other people around me to help me serve properly. But to get started, which seems like that's like the question mm -hmm. of, of your channel, it's all networking, 100%. I could be the best manager in the world. If I didn't know every time I die, they would have never hired me. And how, and how do you know them? How do you get to know them? Because they're- I would, I would tour country. with 18 Visions and Throwdown and either play the fest with ETID or they would jump on our tours. And, and how know? do you know 18 Visions? Uh, I just happened, <laughs> I literally, my senior year of high school, a kid got transferred into my school wearing an 18 Vision shirt. And there was like five Harper kids mm -hmm. in my class, and I'm just like, who, what? And he happened to know all the all the 18 Visions guys. So their drummer, Ken Floyd, I met him, and he introduced me to that whole like, I went to the school in Fountain Valley in Orange County, and he introduced me to all the Newport Beach guys, and those are the guys that were in those bands, and just literally took me with them. Like, oh, this dude's cool. Come on over. So that's the right place, right time. Right place, right time. Just met a dude. About, like, and you got to put yourself out out there to do that like nobody's gonna come to your house and pull you off your couch and say you seem like a cool guy let me introduce you to the world totally. like you have to put yourself out there yeah and i had to be willing to tour for free right and, you know like eat shit for a lot of years and take even when i did start getting paid take less i would suggest like, i just want to make this much i don't i don't want to get paid while all these other guys are getting paid not having the confidence that mm -hmm. you know yet um so there's a lot of eating shit to get to where you are ready to even be a manager or anything in that world, you know, but by by far the biggest, still to this day, the biggest thing is networking. You know, if I need to get on a tour, I can't just submit it through the agency and say like, hey, like look at my band. It's like, okay, who knows mm -hmm. this camp? Who knows, I, and I don't need to know, don't take me right to their manager. If I, if I gotta climb a few people to get in the right space, in the right room, just to be like finally co-signed by the right guy to where the manager takes my call, Great, I'll start however many little steps I gotta take. But in my world, I mean, it's a it's text terms, you know, mm -hmm. text terms with promoters, mm -hmm. labels, agencies, you know, it's very, very easy. I have this network mm -hmm. built rock solid, but um, my network grew on tour. Like I, I, when, when I'm having an issue with someone on tour and they're playing like, I hate this room because of this, like, oh man, I've been in that room, I can relate for this. It's like, I have a lot of experience and, and, and the fact that I've toured a lot, I meet those promoters and I meet these uh, people in other cities and other, you know, whatever. I don't even travel that much anymore. Mm -hmm. Now with the family, I'm not the guy that like flies to London for the big show or like gets to the New York show for the start of tour. I just, it's, I have too many bands and I, I got to pick my battles, you know, I, 
I won't miss a show in SoCal, no matter what. I'll be in San Diego, OC, LA, like I'm there. But to get me across the country, it's hard, dude. It's hard. We have two kids and like I run the I run the company and, and other side businesses and like just have my own hobbies. I'm like getting older, like being being away from like my routine of like the yeah. gym, jujitsu and all that just sounds like a nightmare. And it's yeah. like, do you guys really want me here? Like I know when I was on tour and it'd be New York and we're stressed out and everyone would be like, oh, and by the way, management coming. The whole yeah. band goes, <sighs> the, whole, the whole band goes, uh, you gotta cater. And it's not like they don't like the manager, but it's just like you're in your One more routine. layer of things to just think things about. Just things to do. Yeah. And like at this day and age, like I don't, we don't need to get into a room and like meet face to face with my booking agent every day. I don't. We text and talk a hundred times a day. Just because our band's playing in New York doesn't mean like this is a new thing. And that's, right. you know. I don't want to say that's like that's bullshit. I see a lot of people doing it. It's just for me, the volume of stuff I'm doing and the, the kind of the relationship I've created with my bands. I, I create responsible bands that mm -hmm. don't need to be like handheld through everything. And if it's like a big thing and like we're really stoked, like of course, of course I'll be there. Yeah. But you're 37 time playing, you know, Chicago. Right. Like I'm stoked it's sold out. Like trust me, I'm very grateful. Do you, do you really need big? Do there? you need me there? Do I need to fly on a Thursday to be there on a Friday to rush back on a Saturday just to be shot? Like the, yeah. you don't need me there. Just yeah. picture like any other show, it's gonna go off just fine, right. you know? <laughs> and, All right, well, thank you very much for uh, your words of wisdom. Super interesting. Uh, is there anything you wanna plug or promote or tell anybody watching to do? Um, I'm stoked you're even watching the channel because it means you're trying to do something a little left to center in some way of your life. And that's my biggest advice to anyone. Don't, don't think you gotta go get like a normal job and just fall into the rat race because the rat race sucks. So do whatever you can to not be the rat race and uh, you know if it means eating shit for a few years there's nobody almost nobody you know that's just like yeah I just walked in everything was great you eat shit and you eat a little less shit and you eat a little less shit and all of a sudden you're not eating shit anymore so eat shit but not too much shit all right <laughs> sounds good